although there will be some academics which will tell you this is the only way you should learn this is what you should do and this is what you shouldn't do what's overlooked is the way it's communicated Welcome to ForBassPlayersOnly.com. I'm John Liebman, founder and first baseman. If you've ever wanted to learn bass, you should know that right now there are thousands of people inside the For Bass Players Only community, a lot of them over 50, and they are learning bass, having the time of their life playing music that they love. You should come join them and experience that incredible transformation for yourself. Remember, you're never too old to groove. So let's play bass. My guest this week is also a, uh, a passionate bass educator. Philip Mann is an award-winning bassist, music educator, and published author. He's performed with everyone from The Drifters, Van Morrison, Leo Sayer, Albert Lee, Steve Morse, Billy Bragg, T.M. Stevens. The list just goes on and on. I have to ask you about T.M. because I uh, did some traveling with him. In addition to his book, Chord Tone Concepts, Philip has made over 100 contributions to Bass Player magazine. He's played all kinds of Broadway musicals. From Dancing in the Street, Jesus Christ Superstar, Fame, Grease, Hairspray, Little Shop of Horrors, Anything Goes, The Pirates of Penzance. He's performed at corporate events for Microsoft in Turkey and the British Chamber of Commerce in Egypt. Quite an interesting life. He's played on the QE2 in Dubai, the Formula One Championship in Monaco, the Cannes Film Festival in France, and so much more. This is his first time on ForBassPlayersOnly.com. Welcome, Philip. So great to have you here. John, you seem to know more about me than my wife. Um, <laughs> well, you've done your homework. Good for you. Um, uh, and ladies and gentlemen, here's John. Uh, so it's good. How are you, buddy? Good. I'm, I'm a longtime admirer uh, of you and uh, and your music and what you've done. You are an inspiration to all of us. So, uh, so yes, I uh, I do my homework before I, I do these. But what I'm getting at is uh, I, I really enjoyed learning about you. And we've met a handful of times. Last time we saw each other was at the NAMM show in uh, January of 2024. And uh, boy, it's taken this long to try to get a few minutes with you because you're always off doing something or going somewhere or playing with somebody. So tell me what's yeah. going on. Yeah, it's tough, isn't it? Um, I think for the viewers that are watching this now, I think John and I have reached out to each other about two or three times now to try and actually schedule this chat. Um, but unfortunately, the, the way my life is and the time difference, obviously, London to, to the U.S., it's it's incredibly difficult um i i have a colossal working calendar um just before we came on air i was saying to john apologizing for the exact thing we were just mentioning uh, last year i did uh 241 shows and which meant six days a week um and that's touring that's not in the west end or on broadway so i'm four hours each direction and then if i'm not on the roads uh I have a, a purpose-built home studio. You're in. This is this is nine volt studios here. Um, you can't see, but in front of the cameras here is all my preamps and my workstation. So there's always a backlog of things that I need to record. Um, and I have a, a huge alumni of private base students, which is all part of the with uh, the with base in mind forum, uh, which is me uh, on my own steam uh, doing it the way I feel it should be done, as it were, um, which is incredibly intimidating uh but amazingly rewarding uh and we can talk about that when when the times when the time's right well i'll tell you what you've got such an interesting story and you've done so much but let's let's start from the beginning how would you describe the early days your musical upbringing and what attracted you to the bass do you come from a musical family where there are records playing your know, brothers and sisters your parents taking you to shows and you know what okay. was that um well, first of all, there was no musical upbringing. Um, I was an athlete. Um, I was a, a 400 meter track runner when I was a kid. Um, and I planned on going into physiotherapy, sports physiotherapy. Um, and I didn't start playing bass guitar until the end of the first years of my A-levels. Um, it was by, it was through complete jealousy. 
all my friends. Sorry, the end of your first year of what? A levels. So it's a qualification UK before we go on to degrees. Um, but I was looking forward to doing a having a career in physiotherapy, and uh, out of pure jealousy, uh, my friends were all in garage bands, and I decided that uh, I wanted to hang out with those a bit more. Uh, picked up the bass guitar and and it, it completely changed the path of my life. Um, I took to it very quickly. Um, I'm I'm not an academic uh, in other fields. Uh, I've if you talk to me about high school uh, diplomas and equivalents, I would have barely passed. Um, but uh, I get music and I get the bass guitar. So I I went very quickly from never playing a instrument to being an honors degree graduate um purely because I, I found my calling nothing more uh but it happened what very nice. about the the bass most people pick up the guitar first or uh you know piano uh, again i i remember we said about this environment this garage band environment i had some friends that were all in high school bands and it was literally i remember it now it was an an aria pro mab 20 um it was sitting in the corner of the garage i picked it up and went this works for me uh it really was that um, unbelievably juvenile um bland i wish there was a better answer i was there through jealousy i picked up something and found my calling uh and it completely altered my path um i i dropped out of high school i'll just use high school for the american audience uh I can do it. and um and just worked five part-time jobs to accumulate the money to go to music college. And um, that was when I was 19. I'm 45 now, uh, and I'm still doing it. Uh, so that's it. Nothing else has changed. Well, so you must have started listening to music differently once you discovered the bass. Did you did you seek out the, the bass lines? Did you have any bass influences? You know, it's, it's funny, as a as a child i'd make mixed tapes like you do you know for any any sort of romantic for their partner or stuff like that um and I, I actually found one of these tapes in my later life i was transferring old recordings onto digital formats and i found some of these keep safes from when i was a child and when i was playing them i realized the amount of songs that had bass intros and i remember commenting on that to my wife callie there was you know, the reflex Duran Duran was on there, Living on a Prayer, Bon Jovi was on there, you know, big bass grooves, you know, it's like, and, and I never realized that at the time because I wasn't aware of the bass instrument. Um, but it seems my ear was already being conditioned towards it naturally, you know, and uh, so, yeah, there was a, a romance looking back uh, on, on, my, on my earlier years. And like, oh, wow. So I actually probably was being gravitated towards it naturally, but I was unaware. Well, what about in school with your peers? You must have been exposed to a lot of music. What were other people into? What were you into during the, uh, the university years? Very, very different to now. Um, with a lot of my students today, I, I laugh because I say, do you realize I'm, I'm not as much of a spring chicken as I'd like to be? Uh, but I say, do you realize we grew up to the same band? In the beginning of the 90s, I was listening to Green Day uh and dookie and now you guys are listening to green day uh american idiot and you know there was these sort of comeback things and just recently um one of my earliest influences uh was pino paladino and a lot of those wonderful melodic bass lines that then you would hear with say um tony living with uh you know peter gabriel kate bush stuff like that and i remember learning some of those lines as a younger man and now recently kate bush was at the top of the billboard again because of stranger things and running up the hill and i have students of teenage years now going oh, i really want to learn this bass line I mean, that's hilarious i learned that 25 years ago and having to re remind myself how it went you know <laughs> well what about your career how did that get started what sort of things were you doing initially um i think like everybody I I came to the base. Actually, no, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna immediately correct that. Um, a lot of my peers were in 
bands where they just you know jam rock bands playing zeppelin covers and that sort of stuff and just playing and from my very first ever bass lesson i was quite academic you know i i sat with my teacher he wrote on a staff this is an e playing e so the very first time i even interacted with the instrument it was reading from manuscript um so i had a very formal academic approach to the bass but in some ways i had to teach myself to become more contemporary you know not just read what was written interpret what was written not just play the dots exactly as they are have my own personality so i think where a lot of my friends were just discovering sounds discovering ways of playing and expressing themselves i was very much more about trying to interpret the page in front of me so from literally the very first lesson i was quite academically charged um and that led straight into music colleges and uh, I, I went from never playing the bass guitar to being in formal education three-year bachelor's degree um immediately literally immediately i started saving the money to do it privately um and because of that sort of very formal approach i was very very aware i was very industrial about how to make a living how to be a sustainable have a sustainable career and income i just did the maths um okay there's four weekends in a in a month if i do 100 bucks each weekend i'm going to earn 400 bucks say i'll play twice a week 800 bucks my rent's 12 1200 bucks where am i going to make up the extra money so from a very early stage i was going okay i need passive income teaching uh so the same same time that and rate that i was learning practical skills on the instrument um unlike a number of my peers and i'm not being pretentious but i have formal academic training as a teacher so i have a, ma a master's degree in academic practice so many people have base qualifications i also have teaching qualifications and i did those hand in hand um in the uk I was probably in academia for the first 10 years while simultaneously generating a playing career. And that only really changed a pathway when I moved to America. And I, uh, I lived in Tampa. I was a student of Jeff Berlin at the Player School of Music. And then subsequently, uh, I taught at the Player School of Music. So, it, it, you know, it, it, that's where my life forked a little bit. Yeah, I've I've been to that place, Tampa, St. Petersburg, right around there. His his wife, what's his wife, Vicky? I remember. Yeah, Vicky Berlin. Yeah, oh, full of around and uh, the, the pictures of. Uh, actually, I think she let me sign the wall, or I don't know. You know what wall I'm talking about? Where all I the base in the canteen. Uh, I've I signed it a number of times as a student and as a teacher. Um, I actually have a photograph that I'll send you on social media, John, um, where I have an entire roof panel that I entitled the the British invasion um, and then put my dates all the times that I taught there and 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 was a guest master classes faculty and a student so yeah I had quite a long time and actually that that period of time with Jeff was the catalyst um, for my career that followed subsequently I became an author um, I have six books out um, I'm about to release the fourth the fourth part of Chord Tone Concepts, you mentioned that earlier on, as one book, it's actually a series of four. Um, and subsequently, things like my articles, I was sought out to write for Bass Player magazine, uh, for which I had a, an ongoing techniques column for over 100, you know, you do the maths, over 100 articles, which was I'm very proud of, because I grew up on Anthony Jackson's columns and Jeff Berlin's columns and to have my own column feature for such a massive amount of time uh, i'm very proud of that very proud of that indeed i remember i'm a little older than you back in the 70s before bass player magazine there was guitar player magazine so oh. tommy tedesco would write his article every month and there was one page in the whole magazine for i think it was called like the bass player's corner or something like that herb mickman used to be the columnist does that name does that name ring a I bell know, I, I i'm such a i'm such a music historian that i've actually sought out some of those magazines i have them um uh from from ebay uh i tried to when bass player unfortunately we, we saw the demise of bass player yeah. um i actively tried to 
pursue every copy ever um, and then make them as digital so I could keep them as, as, as archive going forward. I had like literally hundreds and hundreds of them. And we moved a few years ago. And what am I going to do with all these? I ended up <laughs> selling them. Some happy customer bought them. But uh, yeah, that's a lot of, lot of, actually, I saved a few of them. The yeah. jock ones. And, uh, yeah. I've, got, very, I've got very... a vault. Uh, I have a vault here. And there's a lot of my personal files in here. And there's a, a number of folders, which are basically just my columns cut out, put into a, a laminate folder. Uh, so yeah, I'm very proud of it. It's great. It's great. I had the privilege of doing that too. When there there was bass guitar magazine and there was bass magazine, and then in future eventually had both of them. But I used to write Joel, Joel McIver. You must know yeah, that. I know Joel very well. Yeah. Oh, what a great guy. But I, I don't want to get too far off. You were talking about um, music education, bass education. What an opportunity I have having you here. Most of the people that I'm attracting here at For Bass Players Only are are men in their 50s, 60s, 70s. I have students actually in their 80s. And I, I'm getting a fair bit of women now too. But the point is they're not setting out to have a career in music. They're not looking to play sold out arenas to their adoring fans around the world. You know, they want to get together with their buddies and play some classic rock riffs or some blues shuffles or, you know, whatever that some of them are into funk R and B, maybe a few of them are into slapping. And one thing that happens, well, more than one thing, but some of the things that happen when you get to be that age, arthritis kind of creeps in and tendonitis and, and things like that. So I'm just telling you this to give you a context so you know who we're talking about. But okay. what, what a what a rare opportunity to have you here. I want to ask you what advice you could impart to somebody like that who wants to learn to play bass? What should they be thinking about? What kind of goals should they have? What questions should they be asking? You know, jump in anywhere. Okay, John. Well, um, if I may, I'm going to step back a little bit in order to frame that a little bit more. And uh, maybe this will act as a catalyst for those guys watching and they will go, that's something I've never really thought about. Um, First of all, there's no right and wrong. And some things that I'm going to say now, you'll go on social media and you will see certain musical academics or academically minded people may have a different opinion. And you'll go on the internet and you will see resources that suggest different pathways. Um, but I'll make you aware of something. Um, if you are uh, a trained teacher, there are certain ways that you're taught to respond to a lecture room um i would look in i'd go into a lecture room and i would be able to ascertain types of people i'm looking at um their attention span their achilles heels if they're being distracted by the people next door to them uh whether or not they're confused just by their facial expressions and then you would work very hard on differentiation different tactics to bring all these people into the class so that the outcome, the one outcome, can be communicated to everybody. Now, one of the things that trained teachers will get exposed to at many levels, whether it be high school equivalent or postgraduate degrees, is a process called VARK, V-A-R-K. Now, that stands for visual, audible, reading and writing, it's a subcategory, and kinetic. Now, although there will be some academics which will tell you this is the only way you should learn, this is what you should do, and this is what you shouldn't do, what's overlooked is the way it's communicated. Now, John, I could say to you, um, John, we're going to play a scale. And you go, okay, I'll play a scale. Now, I don't know your personality type. This is how you receive information not how i communicate it this is how you best receive it but i can guarantee and this is motor neuron response this is those academics in white coats have laid this out for us okay you can be a visual learner so you could watch me and i could say john this is a c major scale and i could play it and then you're watching my hand and you go oh i can see how his fingers are working that's a visual you could be 
an audible learner. John, the notes of a C major scale are C, D, E, F, G, A, B, and then you repeat C. You could therefore think about reinforcing your learning. And I could say, John, I'd like you to write down the notes of a C major scale. And you would write them down and then show me. It uses a different pathway in the brain. You're learning in a different fashion. Or I could say, John, pick up your bass for me now, please, buddy, and play me a C major scale. Now, what's happened there is I've pre presented the same information as visual, audible, read, writing, and kinetic. And hopefully, more often than not, actually a very high percent, this is a high degree level that we're talking here, not, you know, uh, nursery or kindergarten, you know. One of those processes will reach out to you. And you'll be in a lesson with me and you'll go, ah, oh, when he played that, I didn't get it. So, oh, but when I wrote it down, it made sense. So the lesson is communicated. My job is a communicator. Okay. And I'm hoping that's one of my strengths. A C major scale is a C major scale, John. It can be given to you via everyone from Victor Wooten to the guy that lives down the street. But it's how you communicate it that makes a difference. Um, this is the reason why I wanted to set up my own teaching platform, because I didn't feel that those disciplines were being properly met. And it allowed for massive holes, not in the content, but in the communication. So I sat down and said, how can I deliver content in a manner which abides by all of those in points? So if you have uh, anybody on your teaching platform, it doesn't matter their age, their background, uh, the genre they want to play, whether they play four string, five string, six string, fretless, what I'd ask them to consider is not what you're playing, how are you consuming it? Because I might say to you, John, we're going to play a ZZ Top bass line. And you go, yes. But then I could play it to you and you go, it made no sense. So then I'd go, okay, well, let's write it out. Here's eight notes. And then that makes sense. Or I need to record it and play it for you so you can see it. Or I could send you the audio and then you could learn it by ear. The objective is to play a ZZ Top bass line. But how I communicate that to you is what counts. And that's the sign, that's the pedigree of a great teacher. Um, and that's the reason, the bottom line, and there's no malice, I'm, I'm a very transparent person, and that's the reason why I decided to part ways with Scott Space Lessons and do my own thing, because I didn't feel that I was able to communicate that on their chosen platform in order to communicate the way I've been taught to teach, which is, I hope, how I've got my reputation I've got to therefore do it on my own platform and do it my way. And it's been an amazing success over 251 to one private students now, uh, which if you think about that, put 250 people into one room. Um, that's a lot. I know you get these figures, which are 40,000 subscribers, 14,000 subscribers. I teach all of my students one to one. 250 hours, that's a shed load of hours. So it's been a massive success. Small in the world of the internet consumption, but huge to the individual. You also have classroom lecture instruction and experience, correct? Yes, sir. I used to teach lecture halls of 150 people, music harmony. Because okay. uh, that's what I wanted to ask you, 150 people, and they, they don't all learn the same way. So you, do you try to juggle those four things? So at some point you'll hit everybody the way they learn or how do you, how do you negotiate? You, on a large scale, when you're entertaining, a, uh, I'd rather have classrooms from very small numbers, sort of a dozen, right up to very large where every discipline of music is put into one room to lecture everybody simultaneously, which I don't prefer for that exact reason that you just mentioned. It was a job being paid for it i have to be able to do the best of my ability um but universities funding come from bums on seats so if they can get more people into the room they will but yeah exactly that i will enter a room and i will set different tasks you know for different musicians um if i'm working with drummers drummers 
are not melodic instruments. So I will set them singing tasks. Let's learn a triad, but we learn it by singing harmonies. And then they can feel it and they can understand the harmony that way. If I go to guitarist, then we do it with chords. If we do bass players, I would do different registers and structure it similar to the singing with drummers. But yeah, I would literally completely remodel my lessons to my audience. Um, and this is the gripe that I have with recorded content. It's a very delicate subject because it's convenient and consumers choose they choose to consume music in that way okay um but you can drive a car of your feet john it doesn't mean you should okay and uh this is my point whereas if i get to teach a specific person i want to change the, my delivery method to suit their consumption not force them to understand me but if i'm standing in front of a digital camera and i'm recording a lesson how many ways can I actually perceive that without seeing my audience, without seeing their reaction, without seeing some guy's head down, some guy on social media chatting to his friend? I need to be able to look at them, bring them into the class and then communicate them into a way that they will, you know, they will be exposed and, and enjoy the lesson. The old analogy, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Nonsense. Just need to find a new way of teaching a trick. And that's the difference between a teacher and somebody that's delivering information. A teacher will find a way of communicating it. Wow. I would, I would say any student that has you as a teacher is very lucky to have you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. <laughs> so you obviously put a lot of thought and a lot of energy. I, I physically couldn't do it. There are not enough hours in the day. I took on some private students during covid I thought I was going to do it for a month or two, and some of them hung on for a few years. But I've I've got just so many students, and yeah, I'm I'm not going to pretend that that one on one with immediate reaction from a person is not better. But you know, there's there's no way that I could reach as many people, or Scott could reach as many people, or yeah, but another thing that you said, you you must know what's his name, Tony Gray. You know Tony. Where do I know Tony Gray from? Oh, he's he's uh, well, he's from England. I figured you'd know. <laughs> a bigger face than you think. <laughs> Actually, I think he lives in Pittsburgh now. But he's he said that uh, he, he couldn't bring anybody. He doesn't want to bring anybody else onto his teaching platform because nobody else gets it the way he gets it, the way he teaches. So he puts a lot of that. Jeff Berlin is on your website. He said that uh, you're one of his top four or five base educators, right? He has an issue with me because I use uh, tablature. <laughs> well, there's, okay, so let's let's frame this. And let's be diplomatic. Let's be diplomatic. Um, first of all, if I may, let's, let's, let's take a step back and let's talk about the platform a little bit. Um, okay. We spoke about how you, to communicate information. Um, I haven't, I've, I think you spoke earlier on, uh, I have a, quite a heavy performance career and recording career um just recently won uh international awards uh for my studio work not just teaching uh the academic uh we was one best international artist and best international single at the texas sound country music awards um Congratulations. a record called thank you texas which is amazing um i'm not saying that to be you know to big up myself or pro what i'm saying there is that it's so that people understand that teaching is part of a portfolio of my career. I'm very much of recording. I'm very focused on that. I'm very focused on my live work. I'm currently the Drifters touring bass player. Um, I do an awful lot of demonstration work. If anybody was at NAMM in 2017, I launched the Music Man Stingray special. That was me. Uh, and I was on stage with Albert Lee and Steve Morse when we did that. Um, and since then, we now have a preamp pedal that's just come out um with sushi fx and obviously my own book range so it's very much a portfolio many different things um but my teaching platform i recognized there wasn't a huge amount of hours i could give to it one of the great things about doing recorded content is you can record one lesson and sell it to ten thousand people um and there's a place for that there is a place for that there's convenience the ability to go online and books but what i tried to do 
was how can I take this way? This is the way that people are choosing. This is very important to stress. This is how you're choosing to consume music education. You could sort out a bass teacher. You could go to their house. You could buy literature and you could study. You choose to go onto YouTube or subscribe to platforms. Okay. Um, but if people are going to invest in me, how am I going to deliver this platform in a way that I find more suitable? Okay, so first thing, uh, every single one of my students books their own time slot. We have a calendar, I go online, and because of the world time differences, they go, that suits me, and they book their own hour. Every, hour, every week, I will say, these are the hours I can teach. Some days, I can't teach. I'm on tour. Other days, I have the full day, so I'll teach 12 hours, and I have done that. And I've done ludicrous things like got home from a gig at three in the morning and then started teaching Australian students. Um, I can do that because of the world clock, because of the internet. So what do I do in my lessons? Well, the first one with base in mind is we record the lesson the same way as you're recording this interview. Well, immediately, that means that every one of my students has a bespoke tailored lesson, which is 100% for them, of me communicating my VARC, to them in a way that they want to receive it but it's recorded so they can stop and rewind and keep it on their on their laptop forever the same as you would with any of these subscribed base lessons online what's different communication you have the ability to ask questions to challenge me is this right is this wrong and get immediate feedback and am i holding this right is this how you would do it and see all of those things visually. The audio is there as well because you're hearing me teach the lesson. Once we finish, that recording is obviously uh, put into the chat so you can keep it. But you receive an email from me. And my email plans out a bespoke email. It's 100% made up for the individual. What I need you to do. John, in our lesson, we spoke about this scale. I would like you to practice it here. Do this, do this, and do this. And I literally give you a list of things. On the email, I will attach what the With Base In Mind students jokingly refer to as the manual, spelled M-A-N-N. And they are literally pages that I pull out of an archive of over 600 lessons that I prefabricated on my computer. And I say, this is the content that you now need to read. I put all the PDFs and all the exercises in notation, and tabliture. We'll talk about that in a second. So both of those things run there. So you've now had a recorded lesson. You get an email, a follow-up email telling you what to do with PDF content that's essentially pages of a book which is being made up for your pathway. And then we get the bit which is less, less popular with some of my students. I ask them to record themselves. And in a private link, not a public link they post it on youtube and i go on there and give them feedback i talk about their technique their sound what they're playing and then when we meet next time the beginning of the lesson we reflect on what they did what they should do and then my next lesson is planned on what i received from the lesson um so it's this wonderful perpetual cycle that just keeps generating one lesson after another but there's loads of other things in place. Uh, we have a private forum. You will not find any of this on social media where all my students are together uh, on one platform. They chat to each other and we interchange, you know, good stuff. And I have silly things like uh, I ask people's input, you know, what do you need now? What would you like to see now? And I get there's a lot of correspondence between myself as a teacher and a student. How can I better this platform? What's going to make things you know, generally make your learning experience even more refined. Until very recently, one of the last things I did at Scott Space Lesson, we did the mentoring program. Me and Rich Brown did one-to-one -one lessons. And that actually was the catalyst that started with Base in Mind. Um, but with Base in Mind preceded Scott Space Lessons because that was my publishing label for my books. Um, so I just made that a teaching platform. But each one of my students has all of that per lesson. Now, and it's not cost effective. It's not for me. That's suicide for me. I should be recording one lesson and send it to a thousand people, but I'm a teacher. 
I'm passionate about making sure people receive information correctly. I'm not going to cut corners. And that's one of the things. There is a place for recorded content. It can generate a reach. It can invite people in. It can, because people, at the end of the day, will receive the information in that manner. But it doesn't, it's not one size fits all. So uh, there has to be a yin and the yang. You have to be very diplomatic and bring in all these different resources. Just then we spoke about tablature. Okay, John, here is a written C. Okay, but I can play that C here. And I can play that C here on a five string bass. Exactly the same pitch. On notation, what differentiates those? Nothing. And that is where, for a learning, from a learning perspective, there is a difference. And one of the things that tablet is very good for. I could be teaching you voice leading, okay? Voice leading is a mannerism where I can pass between chords smoothly. It's very beautiful on a bass. But there's mannerisms where I can give you exercises and go, look, guys, two, five, but specify the position. Two, five, two, five, two, five. But without tablet chart, I can't specify exactly where I want you to play it on the fretboard to convey the lesson, the exercise. Tablature is also good for reinforcing things. You can grow out of tablature. There's no question of that. And tablature will ultimately impede your progress. But that doesn't mean it hasn't got a use. And for the beginner who needs reinforcement to go, OK, I think that's a C. Oh, yeah. It is a C because you can always choose to use whitewash and take it out. It's you judging your progress or with the assistance of a player, um, a, a more experienced teacher. Always take information from people you aspire to be, not from people you don't aspire to be. And always sort out people that are more experienced than you. OK, and that's what I did when I went to see Jeff. There were holes in my playing, even though I had I have 18 letters after my name now, John. Uh, it's ridiculous, isn't it? But I still went to Jeff and said, how do I improve my playing? And he made me a better musician. My career can be divided into pre-Jeff Berlin and post-Jeff Berlin. But oh. there are things that Jeff has said to me that I don't agree with. There's things that Jeff has said to me that I questioned. Okay, let's take the big one. Learning and practicing. I'm not going to use the analogy. I'm just going to give you an overview. I personally think there is a difference between learning and practicing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When I learn something for the first time, I have to ascertain where the notes are. What order they come in? How do I physically play these things? I'm going to do that out of time. I'm going to do that at my own rate of learning. And hopefully with the guidance of a, a good gentleman like yourself to tell me if I'm playing right or wrong. But when I practice, I practice in time. Personally, and this is where everybody, some people will suddenly sit up straight. He's a graduate of Jeff Berlin. How dare he say this? Mm. I learn out of time, but I practice in time. Which means when I practice, I practice with a metronome. When I practice, I practice with a timekeeping device. But I learn without it. And that's because I differentiate between the two. Um, in some arenas, you may say, Metronomes are terrible. You shouldn't do it. But I didn't say how I use metronomes. And I didn't say why I use metronomes. Well, first of all, if I put a metronome on all four clicks of a bar, boop, 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 we get a little program telling me where the beat is. But if I take that click out of those beats, I internally now become responsible for greater durations of time. Boop, something, boop. That's now not dictating where the beat is, it's reinforcing where the beat is. Mm -hmm. That's the first perspective. I'm not saying I'm right, I'm not saying I'm wrong. I'm just being democratic here and saying there is a yin to the yang. Yeah. The second thing, John, I spend my life playing to clicks. If I'm in the studio, I am recording to a backing click. Yep. I, I am, I'm very proud to say, a Nashville recording artist. John, I've never been in a Nashville studio in my life. I do everything from here. It gets sent to me. 
as a stem, I put it into logic and I play my bass over it. It has a click. So in order to make sure everything is synchronized and in time, I have to be masterful at playing to a click. Yeah. So therefore I practice with a click. I'm just curious, excuse me, do, do they send you a chart with the Nashville? Yeah, notes? we can talk about that as well if you'd like. like we can do that as a separate thing. Um, <laughs> um, when I'm in theatres, almost every single theatre, Broadway show you can name is 100% to click. 100%. It's only some of the most more refined classical scores that aren't to a click, but you'll probably find the conductor still has one in his ear. Okay? I rush. I can get ahead of the beat. And when I'm under pressure and I am in that environment, it's not about playing, having a click determine my timekeeping. It's me being familiar with that environment so that my playing can be economical and profound. If you have something going, there's the click. Oh, oh scary. Okay. That, that, that's, so I condition myself so that when I'm in that environment, I'm used to it. I'm currently uh, touring with the Drifters, okay? I mean, I just literally spend my entire life going, that's it, all day. I know, I played with the Drifters. But guess what? Yeah. There's a click behind me because there's certain layers in the, in, in the arrangement that aren't present in the live orchestration. There's also live digital screens. So, the choreography on the stage and the musicians are playing to digital backgrounds to so make sure the band is in time with the, the AV, the, the, the VCR stuff, has to be a click. So because of that, I condition myself to play. There are arguments to and from. I'm not saying what's right. I'm not saying what's wrong. But what I am saying, and I've said this to Jeff, you know, and I've said this to Victor and Steve Bailey, all good friends of mine. Okay. There is more than one way to skin a cat, and there's always two sides to a story. Only a teacher who is maybe not being 100% liberal to all learning would dictate one direction. And I will stand here telling you now it's not just one direction. I have to do that every day with every single lesson. Even the way I'm communicating with you now, John, I'm trying to put a perception into our conversation you know that might not be the way that i would communicate with someone else i get it I get it you, you're <laughs> a very deep thinker i love it. it it's funny that going way back to when you're talking about tablature i started doing that because all of my books are published by hal leonard yeah. and and they said you have to have tablature in your books and i figured because largest print music publisher in the world i guess they know what they're doing so i had gotten into that habit and i did all of my online resources like that well i'm very happy to tell you philip that my students my online students were saying i i, I love your lessons i'm learning so much but can you can you do it without the tablature because i'm covering it up or i try not to look at it i was so happy to hear that and i i say all the time you can use the tablature if you're not sure about something or if you want to check don't rely on it try to wean yourself away from it so now i have all of my lessons with uh, they, they all have a, a pdf that you can download but now one of them is with tablature and one of them is without tablature well it's a hard thing and it's great that you're doing that um how Leonard and large publishing companies need a bigger reach. If they don't put it in there, then they immediately, anybody that doesn't read won't buy the book. You know, they, at the end of the day, it's about sales. Um, they thought of that, didn't they? <laughs> yeah, they did, didn't they? Um, Yannick Grisdala, good friend of mine, um, wonderful bass player. If you buy his books, he presents them 100% notation, 100% tablet, I believe, 100% bass clef and 100% treble clef. You know, so you, you buy one book, but only 25% might relate to you. It's been delivered in different manners. Um, my personal texts, if I may. Um, here we go. I came prepared. Here are two of my books, Quarto Concepts. Uh, this, these are about voice leading. Uh, they are very commonly misconceived about permutations. I use permutations in order to deliver voice leading. Um, and if you want to find out about those, 
do a little bit of online research. Uh, but I can tell you about it. It's fine. Um, <clears throat> my text. Each book is an individual study. Each book has elements of facilitated learning, which is where I will set you tasks and then suggest you sit. Literally, I'm very approachable. I've done this task. You send me a message on social media. I will respond. OK, um, but it's it's quite manageable. It sounds like a daunting charge, but I, I do it. Um, I've randomly opened up a page. No bells and whistles. This is study area 3.3 .3 of book three, John. OK, um, and those people that own this book can cross reference this if they wish. Let's hope the autofocus works. The given example has tablature and notation. You can see that there. It's not real clear, but yeah, I can see it. It's there. You can see two stops. Yes. Um, we're asking quite a lot of the autofocus on the computer, aren't we? <laughs> yeah. um, so my given example, this is the key of C. The exercise is then repeated in all keys. All keys don't have tablature. You see what I've done there? And the very first exercise, I've said, guys, here's how it's done. And I've reinforced it. So you have different components of reinforcement in your lesson. But then I set you tasks to then duplicate that in all different keys. And that's when I've then omitted tablature. So that was how I chose to deliver it. I like um, that. So you learn the shapes. That's it. Yeah. Which is so awesome about the base because it's consistent. It, it's all perfect fourths. It's exactly not. That. Exactly oh. that. Um, and then and then I omit it. So that's how I chose to do it. Um, I have to take into other things in consideration. This is something people should always, once again, as a consumer, you need to be wise. I am a self-publisher. You know, I have to underwrite and print my own text with base in mind. Publications is me. Therefore, I can't. I have to think about how many pages the book's going to be. Right. Multiple 16. It, it costs to send. Um, so I need to make it a size. And I thought about it a lot. And I said, no, this is how I do it. I do one with tablature and the rest without. Smaller staffs, less page. Yeah. And it means that I'm kind of meeting the requirements of my learners a little bit more. Yeah. And they've done well. They've done well. They've done well. That's that's awesome. I I could just go on like this. You know, I I must be. I've said this before. I must be a total base geek because this stuff really excites me. So <laughs> uh, you're more than well, it's, good. it's more than welcome. Uh, yeah. You asked me about recording with the Nashville numbering system, maybe. Oh yeah, you don't have to go too deeply into that, but no, uh, okay. It's it's another you know another a partition of my career. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I do an awful lot of. Uh, online sessions. I'm very lucky. Um, back in, well, I must get my years right now. Sorry, John. Um, back in 2019, I recorded a live album with multi Grammy award winning guitarist Albert Lee. He was in Head, Hand and Feet. He was um, in the Hot Band uh, with, you know, with, with Glenn D. Harlan of, of Elvis Presley fame and stuff like that. Um, and he was Everly Brothers for a long, long time, 12 years, I think, was with the Everly's. And he's done, like, if you look up Albert Lee, it's C, he's the absolute maestro. Um, <clears throat> uh, I have a very close relationship with the Lees. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, Albert's son, Wayne, was uh, my best man when I got married. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and I love the Lees very, very dearly. And I was very fortunate to be asked to play bass for them. Um, and I did a, a small mini tour with Albert, and it was a recorded live DVD and CD that came out. The thing was, is when word got around that I was the bass player playing with Albert, uh, I got called for a lot of sessions in that genre. So despite um, doing a lot of different things, uh, let's say I've, if you look at my performances with the Marcus Miller thing we spoke about uh, just prior to recording here, I opened for Marcus in 2011. That was all tapping. Stu Ham sort of, sort of stuff and um, my recording legacy is 90% going playing two beats you know on, on country bass lines um, and uh, I, I got invited to play on quite a number of CDs there's a lot of CDs my name doesn't appear on it just says 9 volt uh, which is my my studios um, and uh, yeah I got, I, got, I got asked to do a lot of that stuff so I get people send me tracks with guide bass could have been put down by the original composer yeah. synth bass and then i get asked to uh replace it 
um, yeah. reamp it. That's the reason why you use this specific amplifier. We can talk about that in a little while if you want to. Um, and uh, and then send it back with live bass on it. Um, when that happens, I will normally get a guide track. I will normally get a very brief um, Nashville numbering system chart. And then I interpret it. Uh, so I, I've got a good ear, quite musical. I've been quite experienced uh, and I stay in my lane and do my job. And I'm very lucky that there's a lot of people out there that like my voice on the instrument. So I send things back and there are some people, Lorn Riley, Peter Donegan, I can definitely outline. Lorne Riley had two number ones last year um, in the country music charts. And on both times he was interviewed and he said that the recordings came alive once nine volt had put his footprint on it. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm very lucky. I'm very lucky that people uh, appreciate what I can do on the bass. Um, but, uh, I, you know, I, people still come back to me and say, no, that was useless. Can you do it again? Um, and uh, uh, well, I, I saw um, who, who was it? Nate Watts at a bass player live in Hollywood yeah. one time. And, yeah. and, and he was talking about, OK, if I'm given music to play, I'm going to play what they want me to play. <laughs> also gonna sign it yeah so kind of what you're talking about you said your own voice on the on the base and, and i like how you said stay in your lane and he yeah. said he does all that but he also signs it because it puts uh, some of himself into it you know i think i think in the modern world john you have to be aware now that that uh, and again please always correct me if you think you've got a different opinion uh, i i am of the opinion now where i think there are bass guitarists and bassists um there are bass guitarists on the internet that have a million performance skills that aren't transferable. So instrument skills, sorry. Um, they're doing things where a bass might not be used in its habitual manner, its traditional manner. And although it is incredibly impressive and I have a huge amount of respect for these people, it's a very small amount of music. But because you see a lot of it on the internet, you are given this perception that maybe that's what you should be aspiring to do. Um, Comes up a lot in, in my interviews, what, what you're talking about. Yeah, there's yeah. some incredibly talented, impressive people on YouTube. But I think what you're going to say is that's not what people want in a bass player. They want to, doom, 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 or, you know, they, they want, want to play what the band needs and what the music needs. And they don't need this all day long. You need great tone and great timing. And yeah. that's it. Um, and that's, that's, that's where... I've then personally been involved. Uh, we this year I was uh, working for Ashdown uh, Amplification at NAM. That's where we broke bread, uh, which is wonderful to see, you, buddy. We had Stevie Wonder on the stand that year as well, which was oh, incredible. Um, but also in recent times we have uh, released this, yep. which yep. is the With Bass in Mind Sushi FX DI box, um, and that's all about tone, nothing else. Uh, so it's yeah, that's the my. So my connection with certain pieces of equipment is circumstantial. Um, okay. Van Morrison. With Van Morrison, I used Ike equipment. I love Ike. Ike are brilliant. Thomas Ike stuff in Germany, brilliant. Fantastic. And Peter Paul. Yeah, Peter Paul was a very dear friend of mine for a very long time. Um, I used Ike because they're very powerful enclosures. But specifically with Ike and his... Here's the thing with tone. They use ceramic speakers, ceramic magnets, not neodymium. Neodymium to my ears have quite a nasally sound. And I have to use the equalizer to try and take that out. I very commonly use equalization to remove, not boost. That straight away will change some people's perception there. I find frequencies and take them out, not put them in. Um, ceramic speakers are much warmer much more natural less harsh less synthetic to my ear than neodymium speakers neodymium speakers sound fabulous john in the correct environment but that might not be my environment um in a recording environment i don't use speakers at all i just go direct uh so i have to think about reamping it's a different pathway so when i was on stage with with van um i was using ike ceramic but they're way too powerful 
if I wasn't at a talking level, if man can't sing at a talking level, it's too loud. In hindsight, I should have been on in-ears. No amplifier at all. And today, with the drifters, I don't use speakers at all. I'm 100% on in-ears. Processing. Why? Well, the lads are all using vocal harmonies. They don't want me being intrusive, putting too much frequencies between 100 hertz, and then they can't work out where their thirds and their fifths are. So although I have a very prominent presence front of house on stage, it's a very minimal footprint. Um, so the Ike stuff, very loud, very prominent. It's not great for that environment. So I'm on in ears with those guys. In studio, I record almost exclusively through uh, U5 by Avalon and with valve preamps. Mm -hmm. High gain analog footprints sound better, period. They do on recordings. Um, I'm not saying that other equipment isn't as good. I'm not saying it doesn't have its place, but for me, digital footprint always sounds a bit nasally, a bit thin. I want an organic, lovely open tone that's very vocal. So I use tube, I use valve. Um, I don't need a lot of EQ, we spoke about that. Um, I'd like things like the Ampeg SVT DI, the Red DI, the um, Noble, uh, great because they're beautiful, big, rich valve um, preamps, but they come at a cost. They're high voltage. You need secondary power supplies, a power brick to get the power into them. They take up a lot of real estate. Um, so I contacted um, Nathan Slade at Sushi FX and said, can we do something? And that's what this is. It's full valve. It's analog. Um, it has a preamp valve in it, variable gain, so I can get those big overviews. But it's got a voltage doubler inside it, which means I can run it on 9 volt. And it's a very small footprint. It also has tailor-made um, magnets in the transformer. So the quality that comes out of this is of a high-grade DI. And there is a difference, viewers, between having a DI component and a DI box. A DI box will produce much more frequencies, much more richer. And when you record with it, you can truly appreciate that with a little phone on your speaker or just chatting in a chat like this it's, it's not won't suffice it won't you know you won't be able to see the benefits uh, that's the same reason why my relationship with ashdown exists i do not use ashdown amplifiers live very transparent it's not for me speakers aren't for me but this little chap this is the lb 2.n it's a very very special bit of kit valve amplifiers send a charge so that means if you're using a valve amp it needs to be plugged into a speaker. Otherwise, you're going to overload the components. You're going to damage your amps. Okay. This has a two notes torpedo uh, in, uh, heat soak inside it. Uh, it's an attenuator, which means I can switch on the amplifier, use it as a recording preamp with all the valves, but it doesn't need to be switched on to a cab. So essentially, rather than old school mic up the speaker, I can take a feed from this directly into uh, my mixer or my interface. Why you put so much thought and so much care into everything that you do? That's just my personality, John. Uh, but that just means I can get a lovely, lovely valve signal without having the bleed, without needing the speaker. And that's the reason why I use this. This is the Ashdown uh, LB 2.0. It's a great bit of kit that guys should look out for. So live put a little valve di box at the end of my pedal board because i'm touring it's very very straightforward pedal boards tune a preamp and a di box mostly for me at the moment um but depending on the gigs that will change and then in the studio i have that footprint and as we spoke about teaching it's it's a different thing with the books and stuff like that i want to ask you briefly what what about the future you told me what you've been doing and the recording and the touring and the gear and this teaching and all this stuff. So what about going forward? Is there something that you've always wanted to do that you haven't gotten around to yet? Or is there something that uh, that that is in the works and it's percolating right now? Um, well, the originally the my core time concepts books um, were actually a university project, John. And I need to stress this to the viewers. Um, there were two books and they were absolutely terrible. <laughs> they were awful. It really feels. <laughs> um, uh, as, as I wrote them before I was had any 
journalism background. Oh, you um, you wrote them? Oh, I thought you were talking about. No, no, I I wrote two books as a student um, uh, of my time with Jeff Berlin, and they were just a big stack of notes. I made them legible, bound them, and sold them. Um, there was not the learning practices were very vague. Uh, the application was very vague. There were typos everywhere. It was a mess. Um, I took them out of print and I expanded the texts, refined the text, and they became the core tone books that you've just seen. Gotcha. Two books became four. And that's because everything is about application. Book one is about triads, giving you the ability to play them dexterity. Book two is about contemporary chord progressions such as blueses, one, four, fives. I take two arpeggios and will change your world. I will change your world. And that's the reason why I've entitled it The Transcendence from Intent to Implementation. That's that book. So I just take two, two arpeggios. I use permutations to improve your voice, your voice leading as a bass player, not just a bass guitarist. Book three, I then take all of the key chord progressions, one, six, two, fives, one, six, four, fives. Talk about the natural numbering system, major harmony, okay? And that's what I present in book three. Each one of these books has all the harmony and theory. They can be bought as individual texts. Book four is what started out as my doctorate. Um, these books were for me to get my PhD, Dr. Philip. Uh, Dr. Phil was not a good thing to get. Um, <laughs> but the fourth text um, was, is the conceptual. It says core tone concepts. It's concepts. So what's the concept? Well, the concept is every single scale you've ever learned, John, I have a way of delivering them, which means you no longer need any of them at all. I know, I can see you procrastinating over that for a second because it's a concept. But consider this. Most scales, I'm not talking about pentatonics or hexatonics or indeed things like the whole tone scale, okay? Most scales, diatonic scales, have seven notes. If we omit one note, and in every scale, there's normally extensions, which we call unavailable or available, good notes and bad notes, okay? You're left with six notes. Well, those six notes can be delivered with nothing more than two triads. So every single scale that you can name, I can deliver probably 90% of the information, omitting the less favorable texts with nothing but two triads. In my first book, I played every single triad you can name. There's only four, major, minor, diminished, and augmented. Play them in every single key, every single permutation you can name. In the fourth book, I show you how you can play over every chord progression you can name, major two fives, minor two fives, and introduce every piece of complicated vocabulary from the Mixolydian mode to Phrygian dominant, the whole tone scale, the altered scale, Lydian, all this very technical stuff with nothing but two triads. That's it. Imagine me saying to you, John, here's the key. If you learn these four structures, I can deliver the most complicated jazz harmony and theory that exists. That's my fourth book. And that was the book that I wanted to write as a PhD. Um, it took me three books to get to the fourth book. Uh, the fourth book is pending right now. I'm hoping to get it out soon. I'm proofreading. It takes some time. Um, when that's like out... Book, the fourth book. Yeah, sorry, say that again. I said I would like to buy that one. Book. Yeah, I sure. hope everyone will. Um, uh, this year, I was incredibly, incredibly proud when my three preceding texts became part of the Berkeley Library. Um, Steve Bailey received them. Um, Steve Bailey put them in, in Berkeley, and I got a lovely photograph of Stevie with one of the texts, and it warmed my heart. Um, I make no apology when I tell everybody I want to teach at Berkeley, period. I don't well, know. What to talk to. 
I would, I would not, yeah, right. That's what I'm hoping. I want to sign the filing cabinet. And if anybody knows about Berkeley, so when Steve started, he had a filing cabinet. Every single artist signs it. And he said, the day that the signatures are full, that's when I'm going to stand down as chair. But he gets to keep the filing cabinet. Um, and so uh, I want to sign the, stack, the, the cabinet. I think, I, I hope I've got something to offer. Um, I don't know what level that will be. I don't know what capacity that could be. It could be online. You know, that's how it is. There's great things now at Berkeley with like the vault with Victor and Steve and stuff like that. There's online courses. There's obviously Steve, uh, Gary Willis and, and Valencia now as well. Um, I don't claim to be the best bass guitarist in the world, John. But that doesn't mean that you can't be a fantastic academic. And the best teachers in the world are communicators. They're not players. And that's the thing to always remember. So... Yeah, hopefully when the fourth book comes out, um, hopefully I'll get onto some people's radars and I know where I want to be. I know where I want to be. So uh, that'd be lovely to say, wouldn't it? <laughs> I could go on like this all day with you, Philip, but I, I do have one more question. Please. If you can imagine, what would you be if you were not a bass player? Something outside of music. Um, okay. Uh, well, <clears throat> we spoke about uh, earlier on that I started out as a physiotherapist. Um, what a lot of people won't know, uh, and I do have a goal, um, and I have a, an incredible affinity with aviation, um, and specifically, um, warbirds of the 1940. If you go on my social media pages, I've flown a 1944 Mark IX Spitfire, um, and, uh, my, my first love is aviation and i would love to go into vintage heritage aviation not jets anything with a piston so if it's a p51d a hurricane uh my grandfather was a rear gunner in a wellington and lancaster bomber during the conflicts of 1939 to 1945 80th anniversary of d-day coming up very shortly um i would very much like to be in that idiom well, you know, you remind me, there's a, a museum in London. I mean, you've got to know about it. I don't remember what it's called. My wife and I were there and, and all the, the relics and the artifacts and the planes from, from the World War II. It's the, uh, it's the, it's the RAF Hendon. Uh, that's the official place where all of our birds are kept. There you go. Well, this has been great, Philip. And like I said, I could go on all day, but I, I think we've, we've got to end sometime, but we could definitely do a follow-up i would love to get together with you again and i'm sure there's so much more we can talk about yeah and if anybody is interested like i said john i, I it's not a sales pitch but i'm a very approachable person um i've always got time for everybody if i've got time i'll give it to you i'm very generous with my time um but the di box the books with base in mind there's a lot of information available on with base in mind.com uh please feel free to go over have a look at my career uh, there's things like the man the basis because I have a signature series from Overwater, Jazz and Precision. So the books, the bass, the preamp, uh, the man, they're all titles on my website. Please go on and have a look. Um, and if you send me a message, you're not going to get a minion. You're not going to get uh, an academic team. You'll get a response from me. It may take a while because I could be on stage, uh, but I will be the guy that replies. <laughs> Well, I know that firsthand. Well, this is wonderful. One more time, with baseinmind.com is the place the one, to go. Friend. That's the one. Yeah. Thank you so much, my friend. You're watching for baseplayersonly.com. I'm John Liebman, founder and first baseman. If you've ever wanted to learn bass, you should know that right now there are thousands of people inside the for bass players only community. A lot of them pretty well over 50, and they are learning bass having the time of their life playing music that they love. You should come join them and experience that incredible transformation for yourself. Remember, you're never too old to groove. I will see you right here next week, same time, same place. Thanks again to my special guest, Philip Mann. In the meantime, let's play bass.